Hi, and welcome back to Terry Talks Television this time. And this time I'm talking about some television from 1964, two television episodes, both written by the same writer, Harlan Ellison, and both for the iconic television series, The Outer Limits. In some ways, they were incredibly influential on future science fiction cinema, and they show that when it came to writing science fiction for television, Ellison was a writer who had a secret source. In this case, it was the fact that he had been a science fiction fan. So let's get started and talk about the first of the two episodes, Soldier. Directed by Gerd Oswald, this one has a really great premise. It's something that hadn't been seen in science fiction cinema before. A soldier from the distant future, at least a thousand years in the future, called Qualo Klobrigny, played by Michael Ansara, is thrown into the past, into 1960s America. And the authorities of the time have to figure out who he is, what he is, and how they're going to handle him. Soldier was the first episode of the second season of The Outer Limits, and it was based on a story that Ellison wrote and had published in 1957, which happens to be in this chunky term, The Essential Ellison, which I happen to have a copy of, and I've read the story. And the story differs from the television episode quite significantly, and I I might as well do this while I'm here. It is a signed copy of this particular hefty tome. So the original story, Quilo, comes from the future, and there's a lot more detail about the war ravaged future in which he was born, grew up, and eventually left for the 20th century. And a lot of it is some beautiful detail on the technologies of a future war. It really does give us some really mind-blowing concepts, and Ellison does it really well. Kylo doesn't turn up in an alley as he does in the TV episode. He turns up in a New York subway, and in his fear of suddenly being somewhere else, where there are a lot of loud noises, and he's very sensitive to loud noises, there's a totally alien situation to him. One of the things he does is he melts the front off a subway train, And eventually he is injured by the cops and taken into custody and slowly, through the help of a philologist who understands language, they learn to understand what Qualo is saying and to speak to him and speak meaningfully to him about the fact that he was from the future and in his future there are two enormous warring sides, the Tricontinentals and the Ruski Chinks. Yes, I know that. It's um, a problematic name. But the story from 1957 is quite different to the last half of the TV episode. In the story, they learn a lot from Carlo and find out about his world and exactly what warfare in the future is like. And he becomes a spokesperson for a worldwide peace movement. He does talks to people and explains to them the horrors of future war with some incredibly futuristic technologies including telekinetic pyrokinetic and telepathic ways of attacking people and the second half of the story gives us some very visceral information about the war in which Kylo finds himself in his own time and that's kind of rare for that era Uh, there was a bit more gung-ho pro-war kind of stuff happening in science fiction at the time but Ellison's story is that anti-war polemic which is not what happens in the tv episode because you got to remember it's 1960s tv they're not going to play things in a pacifist anti-war kind of way to the extent that ellison was able to do in the story instead in the tv episode we get qualo turning up in an alleyway in a very generic backlot street where he scares an old man into having a heart attack he's approached by two cops he vaporizes the police car and is eventually arrested when the cops take off his helmet and the noises of the urban background are, are painful to Qualo, and they're able to take him into custody. So he's taken into custody, and the, a government representative of a, a mysterious agency, played by Tim O'Connor, who a decade later turned up in a, across 110th Street, is studying him. He gets a philologist called Kagan, played by Lloyd Nolan, to study Qualo, and it's Kagan who finds out what Qualo is saying. Names Qualo. Globigny, fight, RM, Ian, D and Dio. He's saying my name is Qualo Globigny. Private, 
R M E N T N D O. His name, his rank, and his serial letters. He approaches him and kind of befriends him and convinces Qualo that he is not his enemy. And the government and Kagan slowly learn more and more about this man from the future. They've already studied his technology and the weapons he brought with him, which are pretty impressive. What they don't know is that one of the enemy was also caught in the effect that brought Qualo from the future to our time. But the enemy is kind of stuck halfway between, but slowly getting closer to our own time. Kagan being a, very much a humanist, and Lloyd Nolan does a nice job of playing the character, invites Qualo into his home where his wife and his two kids, so they've got a nuclear family, which is kind of funny in a way. He tries to adapt to, to living with them for a while and overcoming his assumptions about the world, which are based on the fact that he was born in basically a hatchery and raised in a creche and never had anything to do with family life. He never understood families. He never understood human reproduction in the normal sense as well. Though that's only very lightly implied in the episode. Koala gets himself a gun as well. He runs away briefly, goes to a um, sporting goods store and gets himself a gun. Then we get the usual ending where he and the enemy confront one another and they are both vaporised by an explosion from the enemy's gun leaving us with the question of, was Qualo instinctively just fighting the enemy, or was he fighting the enemy to defend Kagan and his family? There's an ambiguity about the ending of this one, which is incredibly different from the story. But it works. Michael Ansara playing Qualo is really good. He was of Syrian ancestry, so he has a slightly exotic look anyway. They did some interesting things with his hairline, giving him a kind of jagged hairline and giving him a monobrow. And Ansara really gives us a very locked-in kind of portrayal of this very strange character. He was, a, he was an athletic actor, and he also conveys the pathos of the character as much as he does the instinctive savagery of it, which I kind of like. It's a very subtle performance, and it required a lot of him to play the kind of a character that you haven't seen on screens before. Nobody has given us a soldier of the future before, to my knowledge, in any visual medium. Michael Ansara, with the aid of Ellison's script and, of course, the production, gives us a futuristic soldier that is really grounded and believable. This was a groundbreaking piece of television science fiction, and that's based on the fact that Harlan Ellison's native culture, as well as being an American, as well as being a Jewish American, his bottom line culture was science fiction. He had written fanzines in the 1940s, he had written science fiction stories in the 50s, and in the 60s he was going into screenwriting. His cultural background gave him a really layered knowledge of the genre, which many, many other writers who had written and continue to write for science fiction just don't have. It's not to be underestimated, having that cultural background, having that deep knowledge of written science fiction, informing how people write science fiction for various screens. And I think that in that sense, Harlan Ellison, whatever his problematic aspects were later in his life, was a really important person in bringing science fiction to the screen. Like Ellison's second episode for The Outer Limits, Soldier is basically an anti-war story. It shows us the horrors of war. Right from the very first frames of the episode, we see on a large Paramount Studios backlot a war-ravaged landscape with laser beams firing through the sky towards the ground. And this and a lot of other aspects of the story were one of the reasons why there was an out-of-court settlement between Harlan Ellison and James Cameron as the maker of Terminator because of the borrowings that Cameron did, allegedly, from Soldier, and also, to a lesser extent, Demon with a Glass Hand, when he made the original Terminator. Having, from, having a Soldier from the future zap back into our current time was one of the big ones, but that war-ravaged landscape that you see right at the start of Soldier was replicated in a lot more detail and with a lot more technological um, adeptness at the start of the Terminator movie. So there was an out-of-court settlement 
James Cameron never admitted to anything, but he did give across a lot of money to Harlan Ellison. That then brings us to Dean with a Glass Hand, which is probably, for me, the better of the two. I like both of the episodes a lot. Demon with a Glass Hand is very much a capsule episode. Robert Cole plays a man called Trent, who is pursued by aliens called Kyvans, who have come back from the future, as has he, where the Kyvans conquered Earth in 19 days. And suddenly, while they were conquering Earth, 70 billion human beings disappeared and Trent is the only clue to where they have disappeared to. This episode was directed by Byron Haskin who had done a lot of work with George Powell in the previous decade. Now Haskin and the cinematographer Kenneth Peach who had been working as a cinematographer since the 1930s give us a wonderful look to this episode. It's almost abstract at times and that's helped a lot by the fact that they filmed a lot of the location bits in the Bradbury building in Los Angeles, which was the perfect place to film this kind of an episode. It has an old-fashioned look that's at odds with the futuristic line of the story. I was born 10 days ago. A full-grown man born 10 days ago. I don't know who I am or where I've been or where I'm going. Someone wiped my memories clean. And they tracked me down and try to kill me. Playing Trent, the man from the future, with a robot glass hand, is Robert Culp. Now, this is early Robert Culp. He'd done some movies. He wasn't particularly successful as a movie actor, but he was probably at the time one of the most intelligent and interesting actors working in television. Of course, he did I Spy later on with Bill Cosby. He went on to make The Greatest American Hero. And in the meantime, he also did some really interesting writings about film and cinema, which showed that he had a really deep knowledge of his craft and a deep knowledge of the industry in which he worked and the deep knowledge of the history of the industry in which he worked. So I've got a lot of time for Robert Culp's output as an actor. He, he also had the ability to do light comedies. He did Sunday in New York with Jane Fonda and Rod Taylor, amongst other things, and was really great in that as a kind of second lead but in this one he gives us he gives us a really interesting portrayal and he and Ellison sat around uh, between shots in the Bradbury building discussing the script and Culp was really glad to get a script that was so grounded and kind of not like anything else he'd previously seen so he and Ellison became friends based on bonding over this particular episode now, there are only a few other actors who appear in this episode, one of whom is Abraham Sofia, who was in uh, A Matter of Life and Death back in the 1940s for Powell and Pressburger. And he plays one of the Kyvans. And also there is a woman uh, called Consuela Biros, played by Aline Martel, who later turned up as Spock's fiance in an episode of Star Trek. And she gives us a really interesting portrayal too. She tells Trent, she's, she's trapped in the same building as Trent. There's a force field around the building and the Kybans are trying to capture Trent. And she accidentally gets left in the building. She runs a small clothing business out of the building. Um, her husband has died, but her husband was brutal to her. And she kind of takes a shine to Trent, which ends up being tragic. But Ali Martel does a really nice job of that. She gives us a lot of character with very little as well in the way of dialogue about the character. There's not much makeup she wears either. It's not one of those Hollywood roles on television in the 1960s where the actress is doled up with a lot of makeup. And because of her exotic looks, it kind of it works. And it gives us a female lead who has a little backstory, has a little agency, and even though she is there partly as a potential love interest, the twists and turns of that love interest make it a very different kind of story arc for this kind of a story. Now, Trent has a way of dealing with the Kyvans. They have medallions around their necks, as he does. Take off the medallion, the Kyvan is catapulted back into the future. So Trent has a couple of missions, one of which is to find the three missing fingers from his glass hand so that he can find out what his mission is and what is actually going on. And the other one is to smash the time mirror that enables the Kyvans 
to travel back in time and to try to kill Trent, who hides the secret of what happened to the human race in the future. And it works really well. There, there are action scenes in this. There are scenes of pathos. There are scenes where the setup of the universe is explained to the audience. There's a hell of a lot packed into this one-hour episode. And the script is... It's all there in the script, but there's still enough breathing space for the action scenes, which are shot in an incredibly film noir style. And Linda's back again. Which gives it a production feel that's different to and beyond what we've seen in a lot of other episodic television series of the time. I mean, people can compare and contrast The Outer Limits with The Twilight Zone, but The Twilight Zone was morality plays. The Outer Limits was monsters of the week with some really good scares it was it phased more to the horror than the twilight zone did i'm not saying one's better than the other i think they're both great anthology genre tv series but there was very much a different feel to the outer limits than there was to the twilight zone and the outer limits didn't have that anchoring presence of rod Serling the way that the twilight zone did but just to summarize these two episodes soldier ends with a, a mystery what what was the motivation of Quilo as he fought the enemy whereas demon with a glass hand ends in a tragedy a man who has a job to do and is going to be an incredibly difficult and unprecedented job to do in order to save the human race both of them work as science fiction both of them work well as dramas and the acting in both of them is way better than we saw in a lot of episodic television of the time. Though, to be fair, episodic television of the time, particularly dramas, had this enormous resource of actors who had left the studio system a decade before and were now available to act in television episodes. And so there was a richness of talent for series like the Fugitive and Route 66 and Run for Your Life and Twilight Zone and out The Outer Limits to draw upon. And that's why they've lasted too. The quality of the writing, the acting, the direction, the production design, the cinematography in these series is first rate. I think it reached its peak as far as science fiction is concerned with the things that Harlan Ellison did at the time, the two out of limits episodes is one episode of star trek there's a lot of stuff here which changed the course of science fiction in a positive way and if for nothing else we should thank him for that so that's it for this time around thanks a lot for watching if you enjoyed the video please like subscribe and leave a comment let me know what you thought of these ones and which other outer limits episodes you like because there are a lot of them that are really good you can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash paleo cinema i'm giving i've got some giveaways for the patreon supporters there are some donations being given to me by particularly umbrella entertainment and i'm giving some of those away over the next month i've selected the person who won the giveaway for the imprint box set of the world of Susie wong and that's patrick seymour so patrick i've been trying to get in touch with you please send me a message on patreon so that I can get a mailing address and send you out your prize. And as I said, there are more prizes for the Patreon supporters coming up. So that's it for this time around. In the meantime, in the meantime, watch some good television. Don't watch any bad television. Watch some old anthology TV series because you'll always be rewarded diving back into the television. And I think I'm going to do a little bit more of that over the next few weeks. So anyway, in the meantime, look after yourselves and I'll catch you next time.